everyone. So let's have now our third class from Olivier Fier. Thank you. All right. So, who tried to do the homework? Doesn't mean you succeeded. <laughs> who tried? Nobody tried? All right. Who looked at the homework like more than five minutes? <laughs> Ooh boy. <laughs> who looked at the homework and thought, this is crazy, I'm not doing this? <laughs> not even that. Okay, so, well, I, I um, if you're curious about it, I, I put in the solution. So, if it's an age graph, it means it's, it corresponds to what did I say your age graph corresponds to? Hmm? A matrix. A matrix. A matrix. And the age stands for? Hamiltonian. That's right. right. So it's a Hamiltonian made of a bunch of two mode squeezing terms. Uh, for example, there's so two mode squeezing, you've heard from me and you've heard from uh, Zelaket that. You know, it's photon pair emission in those two modes, 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 in those two. It's all over the place. So, okay, it's just for the sake of, okay, let's look at what that does. And what kind of quantum state does that do, right? So that's kind of the, uh, the, 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 the purpose of the exercise, to look at, okay, what do we get out of that? And we kind of know if you just had two modes that, um, We'd have photon pair emission like that, we'd, we'd get some entangled modes, right? We'd get some EPR modes, two mode squeeze states. Right? So um, I have calculated the two mode squeeze state last time, and you know that it's sum over n and n, some coefficient, but it's an entangled state, right? In the photon number basis, it's entangled. In the quadrature basis, also entangled, a continuous variable uh, entanglement. Okay, so now if you add two mode and you, and you have a bunch of correlations. Um, so that's what it looks like. Uh, you can write the matrix. Remember the G matrix, you can get it uh, just by saying, okay, there's no self loop on mode one, so there's a zero for one one. Right? The one two, uh, well, is there an edge between one and two? Yes, there is, so I put a one here. One three, is there an edge between one and three? Yes, there is, so I put a one there. 1, 4, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that matrix, in fact, it's, a, it's called a complete graph right? because everything is connected to everything. And if some of you know uh, graph states for qubits, you might have, a, but this is different from a graph state from qubits. I'm gonna talk about this in a, in a moment, a little bit more. It's a different type of graph. But, so just have to do the, so, this matrix, remember, is the matrix of the Heisenberg equation system, right? The IH bar Q1 dot equals a bunch of linear combinations of the Q1s that are given by the matrix here, right? So in fact, Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 times kappa, and so on. So there's four equations, one for Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and also four equations for the P's, right? And so if you diagonalize the matrix, uh, you decouple those equations, but you decouple them for the linear combinations of modes that diagonalize the matrix. Right? So it's standard algebra to, to solve a differential equation system. Um, and so those linear combinations are these ones. Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 has eigenvalue 4. I said what? 4. Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4? Four. 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 I'm sorry. Four. Oh no, three. Uh, no, it's three. It's three. <laughs> so, you're right. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, the matrix that has ones here has eigenvalue four and all eigenvalues zeros. Uh, and I work with it a lot, so I got confused. But, yeah, because I know the result by heart, and uh, no, I don't. Okay, so I'll change that. It's three, <laughs> and these are minus one. And so, 
Okay, so now I can write my, my, uh, my equations as that mode out, uh, like q1 of t plus q2 of t plus q3 of t plus q4 of t equals q1 of 0 plus q2 of 0 plus q3 of 0 plus q4 of 0 e to the 3 kappa t. <laughs> oh, I can fix it right now. <laughs> That's a good thing about this. Thanks again. All right, and I, I got a bunch of oh, fours here. Here. Yeah, that should be fine. All right. So, um, so I can write, and so this one is uh, because it's a positive eigenvalue. It's anti-squeeze. It's e to the r, right? But remember, for the p's, the sign changes. Kappa instead of minus kappa when you do the thing. So if the Q is anti squeeze, the P is squeezed, which is always uh, not surprising because hey, Heisenberg. Right. Um, so if this is uh, plus 3, uh, then it's, a, it's not the sum of the Q's is e to the 3r, but the sum of the P's is e to the minus 3r. <coughs> so that's what's going to be squeezed. Okay. And then all these other guys have eigenvalue minus 1, so they are squeezed. So uh, Q1 minus Q2 out, Q2 minus Q3 out, Q3 minus Q4 out equals the ints e to the minus r. Okay, so I got those, those modes there. Okay, that's the solution, uh, the Heisenberg equations. I don't know what that means, like, oh, what is, what is the state? Okay, so this, the state, well, these are not states, they are operators. But you can get the states out of that. Um, but these are also called entanglement witnesses. Because those guys, if you measure them, because they are observables, you can measure them. They're the quadratures. You can do homodyne detection on them with a local oscillator. And, uh, so over here you have to measure four of them. So, okay, it's a little bit of work, but it's doable. Um, here you have to measure two. If you see, they should be squeezed. Right? So you measure four fields in your experiment. And I'll show you a, a cluster state later where you'll see how we do it uh, in practice. And you measure four fields and you take the sum of all the phase quadrature measurements and you should have, once you do that sum of all the signals, the fluctuations on that should be, should be less. I.e. When, when you add them, when you look at them individually, they should be very noisy, there's nothing special about them. When we take the four together and you add them, then the noise works. Because the noise is probably anti-correlated and when you add two anti-correlated noise, you, you get noise. Noises are correlated, and you add them, you get twice as much noise. If you subtract them, you get them. Right? Things like that. So that tells you what, um, what kind of things. So that's the theoretical prediction. Okay, so at least we know that if we want to measure whatever state that state is, and I don't, still don't know what it is, we're going to talk about this in a second, all I have to do in the lab is to measure those guys. And then that's okay. As I, as I said, it's, it's just. Uh, Homodyne uh, interference experiment. It's it's you have to set it up. Uh, it's work, but it's not it's not complicated. So so um, and it's variance based entanglement witness because the variance of these guys is less than the vacuum fluctuations, and therefore that you know indicates there's something quantum going on. Now, what's the state? Well, I have the pretty good try state, uh, which is I'm not gonna kill myself. I'm just going to write it like the EPR state. Remember the EPR state? I know Q1 minus Q2 was squeezed. Or in the limit of infinite squeezing, Q1 equals Q2. Right? Uh, so, so in the limit of infinite squeezing, that goes to 0. And so Q1 minus Q2 equals 0. Q3, Q2 minus Q3 equals 0. Q3 minus Q4 equals 0. So I'm saying all, all the Qs are equal. OK? Because uh, that fulfills those three equations. I'm not sure about that one. I'm going to have to work on that one because it's uh, the conjugate of, of observable. So, right, I, if you, if you want to go from the amplitude eigenbasis to the phase quadrature eigenbasis, what do you have to do? Fourier, Fourier transform. Like position momentum. So wh that's what we're going to do. So first I can write the, the, the obvious thing that I have is that I have correlations for these three guys. So I know those Qs are the same. I'm going to put a Psi Q like before for the EPR state. Because if I just keep that guy like that, separable, it's not going to work. 
Uh, it's, it's exactly the same thing as the EPR state, I'm going to run into trouble. So I'm anticipating the trouble, I'm making it more general, I'm saying, okay, I know for sure all these quantum numbers are the same, but now I'm going to allow for some sum over that with some wave function that I don't know what it is. Okay? But I'm going to find out what it is. Now, I have to take that state and apply this guy to it. P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4. And I should get what should happen if I do P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 to that state, given it's in a limit of infinite squeezing. We should have an eigenstate with eigenvalue 0. Right. So if I apply P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 to that state, I should get the same state times 0. Right. So, okay, I take that state, I rewrite it in the phase basis, or momentum basis, right? So I, I just use the Fourier transform to do that. Uh, and I did, super, I did it super fast because, okay. So all the Fourier transform phases are there. And then, of course, you take that integral and you push it, you, you, you swap the sums. And what you get here is the Fourier transform of a wave function that has an argument uh, which is the sum of the phases. And, okay, so now you have uh, that thing, okay? You apply this operator, which is the sum of the phases to it, and so, well, P1, P, operator P1 pops out little eigenvalue P1 plus little P2 plus little P3 plus little P4, they're all there. Right? And this depends as sum of all p's, of course. So this cannot stay in the state because it has to come out because otherwise I'm not going to get the same state. Right? If, I have, if I have to have the state in eigenvalue, I have to get something constant here. The only way to get it constant and equal to zero is to put a delta function there. I put the delta function and that's the result. It looks better on the screen. But I have a sum of a 3p out of 4 where I have three independent p1, p2, p3. But the, the last one is minus the sum of the first three. So, you know, that doesn't look like much. So now I'm going to rewrite that guy in the position basis again, the amplitude basis again. So if I do that, I spare you the... So you go through this and you got delta functions and everything, and boom, what do you see? This is what you get. Right? Because I started with psi of q, I went into the p basis to finish the fourth operator, the sum of all the p's, that made the psi of q necessarily a delta function. Then I'm going back and I look at this and that's all I get. This is a GAZ state in a continuous variable domain. Okay? You remember the GAZ state is zero, all zeros plus all ones. Well, this one is all values of q is equal. Right? There's more than two because it's not a q bit, it's a q mode. Fair enough? So, uh, yeah, so that graph, that complete graph, is a GAZ state, which is funny because uh, if you look at uh, uh, cluster graphs, uh, it's exactly the same thing, but it's, it's, um, it's not, uh, it's just an accident. Okay, so now I want to, uh, I, got, I got a lot of things to tell you because it's the last lecture and I, I'm going to cram everything I haven't told you before so it's going to be horrible. Um, but I, I just want to, at least I will show you some pretty pictures. Um, I will uh, tell you a few things uh, because we've heard about the positive partial transpose in three other lectures, right? Yelena, Danielle, and um, Sabrina uh, in three different contexts. It's all completely positive uh, uh, transpose. Uh, maps and everything. So it's, it's awesome. So the, the, I'm happy to report that the positive partial transpose also is defined in the context of continuous variables. So I'm going to just put that um, as a remark. And you're allowed to yell at me just now, right away. Why should you yell at me right now? Why should you be deeply shocked by what I just said? There's a big problem with what I just said. 
Actually, Daniel talked about it. Uh, the positive partial transpose of what? What is involved by the positive partial transpose? Hmm? If you're not sure, just say something. It doesn't matter. The positive partial transpose of Paris Saint-Germain. It's, it's way negative. No, it's actually completely positive. Uh, these guys are absolutely not entangled with anything. Um, yeah, density operator, yeah. So you, you're saying, yeah? How do you write this? Exactly. It's continuous variables. How do you write the damn matrix and transpose it? Partial or not, right? It's like, ooh. So we don't. Um, even, even though rho is now, so I believe the, the math, uh, the mathematicians call that a normal operator. Continuous matrix. That's the physicists. It's not really matrix, right? So if you want to transpose, you take uh, rho sub ij and uh, you turn it into rho sub ji. But i and j are now real numbers. Real numbers. So there's still a way to do that using symplectic symmetries um, of continuous variables. So uh, there's a guy named Rajya Simon. Uh, Define the PPT operation for continuous variables. using the symplectic group, and so that you've heard of all these keywords, but really, we're not going to talk about it. It's, I love the, the symplectic group uh, results. And so that's in PRL 2000. At the same time, uh, Duan, Luming Duan, and who else? Sirach Zoller. Google. Mm. Did you, no, 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 no. Wait, wait. There, there's the um, there's a memory uh, single photon storage in a polar return, and there's the Gitke, Gitke, Geza. It's a great guy. Gitke, Sirak and Zoller. They addressed separability. There's Sorry. a question here. Uh, it just, I'm not sure to totally understand the problem with the fact it's a, a continuous matrix because form, like formally we could still uh, say a Q, Q prime and we apply the operation and it be becomes Q prime Q. Is it like a mathematical problem? We don't know if it's well defined mathematically? Or? It's not because people have so solved it, but it's, it's a different, it's a di you have to, you, you can't really talk about matrices anymore. Yeah. So I'm sure you know more math than I do. I ha don't have a clue. I know, I know these are continuous operators and mathematicians know how to do stuff with them. Okay. So they're not faced by that. But you know, as, as opposed to, it's just to say that, okay, it's a matrix, it's now continuous, right? Okay. Um, and that's what Simon did. Simon did, it looked at this, he said, okay, it's an operator, fine, and it still has to uh, obey symplectic symmetries, and I know enough about the partial transpose in the context of symplectic group, symmet uh, symmetry group, that I can deduce what it is, and then he, he moved on and, and did basically what you said. Okay, so, um, Duan, Gitke, Sirak, and Zoller, and it's PRL at the same time. Uh, that's why it's called the duan simon criterion at the end. They, um, they decided, okay, uh, it's a continuous matrix, let's not even go there, partial transpose. And they found a criterion that's kind of the same as um, uh, the Paris uh, Horodesky criterion, which is separable implies something. In terms of qubits, it's like PPT. No PPT implies not separable. <coughs> right. Sometimes PPT is not separable too, but okay, so you've heard about this. So same thing here. They wrote, okay, 
two uh, a, a convex sum of product of density operators, separable mixture in general. And then by using a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and a really clever de derivation, they arrived at an inequality. That's an implication, it's a consequence of separability. If that violated, and it's an inequality that uses squeeze invariances that you can measure in a lab. Right. And I'm not even going to... Uh, <coughs> it has to do with delta Q1 uh, minus Q2 and delta P1 plus Q2. And you add them both and there's a threshold and if that inequality uh, is violated then you know you have an entangled state. So there is a uh, Cauchy-Schwarz derivation that gives a criterion. The, 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 um, the remarkable thing is that for Gaussian states, Gaussian CD states, so that means the bigger function is a Gaussian. PPT is necessarily sufficient to separable. So it's like for qubits, two qubits, two qubits, but not for higher dimensional discrete variables. If you go continuous variable Gaussian, you're like two qubits, two qubits. It's a logical equivalence. So if it's, um, well, the PPT is, the PPT means this. But again, Simon did consider the, the PPT, uh, the equivalent of PPT for a continuous operator, density operator. So, so uh, I'm skipping this. For a multipartite entanglement, it's been also uh, figured out. So those of you who are wondering about that, separability criterion as well for mixtures in the general case. And it's due to Peter van Loek and Akira Purusawa. It's PRA 2003. So, okay, so all these things in terms of separability, those separability criteria, and they're used in experiments. We have the, we, so we have we have the witnesses, and we also have the separability criterion that we can use, which are uh, uh, variance-based inequalities. So this is, I'm gonna write this down. I don't want to. I don't want to talk too much about it because. But it's very convenient. So it's very well defined, and it's 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 a very clear cut. Uh, separability, inseparability criterion uh, that works for, um, for all continuous variables. So if it's Gaussian, which is all squeeze states are Gaussian bigner functions. They're just <coughs> bigner functions are not, don't have the same width in the two orthogonal directions. Um, for non-Gaussian states, it's, it's uh, separability uh, implies PPT, like so the contraposition is, is, can be used, but then if you have PPT, you're not sure if it's separable or non-separable if it's non-Gaussian. And there's been studies of bound entanglement by uh, Roman Schnabel and Jens Heiser, including experimental results as well. Okay, so I just wanted to put that on your, uh, on your radar, and uh, I wanted to talk about teleportation a little bit. Um, and it's gonna go too fast, so so I'm sorry, but it's, it's last lecture, so it's like fireworks. Right? <laughs> Woo -wee! So this is a, a quantum teleportation circuit, and the way you go about it is uh, because Zilla showed uh, already the equations, and it's a good old um, Bennett Brassard uh, uh, and et al. Uh, teleportation protocol. So you have a state. You have a state psi here, which is the thing to be teleported. It's arbitrary state. Here you have two qubits. Uh, these are qubits, right? So we'll switch it back to qubits for a second so that you can get your bearings, and then we'll jump back to Q mode. Um, 
So these are two qubits in a zero state. We put one in a, through a Hadamard gate, so what comes out there? Put zero through Hadamard, what do you get out? Hmm? Too many people are, the, are, are responding, it's good. I can't hear yeah, it's like, come on, speak louder. All at the same time. One, two, three. Plus. <laughs> I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was looking for zero plus one because I'm pedestrian. But plus, yeah. So plus, plus the C naught here, C X, right? So it's zero, zero plus one times zero, and of course it entangles because zero does nothing here, but one flips. So now we have zero, zero plus one, one here, right? And this whole thing here looks complicated, but these are just measurements in the zero, one basis. But if you put the entangling stuff before, that's equivalent when you're here to measuring the bell basis. So that's Alice here doing the measurement in the bell basis of Psi with half of the bell state that she has. And she measures in the bell basis, chains to Bob, and depending on what the measurement results, Bob will do nothing or X or Z or both. Standard quantum teleportation. And every time the measurement, and that's the beauty of, of this, right? it's kind of an epitome. Actually, teleportation gates are a primitive for quantum computing, so if you understand teleportation, you probably understand half of quantum computing right there. <laughs> the measurements are random. The results are random. We do not know. There's four bell states. We could get, they're actually equiprobable if you do the, the bennett brassard calculation, which takes uh, just a few minutes. It's very illuminating. You can get 25% chance each of the bell states. They're completely, totally equiprobable. But it doesn't matter. Because, so the projection is completely random on Bob's side, but this is what does the job. The classical communication link, where Alice sends the measurement results to Bob, and Bob knows now for sure what happened to the state, and can fix it. Right? By redoing the same Pauli that were uh, byproducts, in fact, of the, of the measurement. Okay, so um, if I wanted to do this with... Um, Q mode, what would I, uh, what would I do?
over all the queues of all the cat queues for Humoon and uh, go, go IP finding. Humoon 3. Make sense? That's the Fourier transform, but since it's the p equals zero state, the phase factors are all one. Okay. And I can write for the reference that p equals, I like to put one, uh, e to the i p q q e q. Yeah. Okay, so if I do that, then I apply the CZ gate, the CX gate. And the CX gate is going to be what? It's going to be E to the uh, bo 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 minus I Q2 P3. So X is a shift in a Q basis. It's a, it's a flip, right? X is a bit flip, so it's a shift in a Q basis. So it's E to the minus I P. And it's conditioned by the value of Q, computational basis, on Q bit 2. So I apply that thing on that state. And so that gives me uh, trouble because I have. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna take it different from zero then. <laughs> because uh, it's not gonna do anything. Wait, wait. No, 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 no. Sorry. It's the reverse. This is the control Q mode. That's the target Q mode. So it's. Q3, P2. All right. Okay. Here. Right. So, out is CX, Q equals, so EX32, uh, Q equals 0, 2, P equals 0, 3. And that's going to be, um, okay, so the e to the i q3 applies to ket3, so it's e to the i q prime, right? And then that thing comes hit that guy, and it's just a shift by whatever q3 takes, so it's all inside the integral, sum of a q prime, e to the minus i q prime p2 of q equals 0, mod 2, and that's just sum of the dq prime, um, 0 plus q prime, so q prime. And I still have the other guy, because it's never, it never changed. It's a control bit. So there, I probably have an entangled state here, right? That's an EPR state. So that's good. So you see that it works like that, the same way. And you, so here, there is a Q measurement. This is a Fourier transform. This is an inverted. So it's an EPR basis measurement. Here, we're going to have to do, instead of X and Z, which is bit flip and, and phase shift, we're going to have to do amplitude shift and phase shift displacements in phase space of Q. And at the end of the day, you're going to get that. OK? So. Um, Right? So, just to show you this only uses infinite, infinitely squeezed states. And I'm going to stay, stick with that for a second. It's all uh, back in the first lecture, right? I had that big printed sheet with all the qubit 